Hey everybody, welcome back to this episode of The Dirt Podcast. We're back here at Day Air Ballpark. I'm your host, Brad Eaton, joined once again by my co-host, Andrew Hayes. What's up, guys? Today we've got a special guest with us from the Dragons dugout, Dragons catcher, and Cincinnati Reds 2021 first round draft pick, Matt Nelson. Matt, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on here. Awesome. So let's take a look uh, back before you got drafted, right? Quite a uh, quite a 2021 you had here. So there's a lot of accolades. So I had to write this all down just to make sure I didn't forget anything. Maybe the, you know. So your third season at Florida State at that point, you were the 2021 ACC Player of the Year. You led the entire nation in home runs with 23. You won the Johnny Bench and the Buster Posey Awards as the best catcher in the country. You were first team All-American and got selected uh, just after the season in the first round, 35th selection overall by the Cincinnati Reds. Not a bad 2021, and this is like this isn't even July 4th yet. We're talking about right. at this point. Tell us about that season. I mean, obviously you had been at Florida State for a couple years. You'd been working your way up to that. What do you attest that season to? Was that something that that you saw coming? Was it work? Was it change? What what was it for you? Yeah, so it, it all started during COVID actually. And during COVID, I uh, you know I thought I was in pretty good physical shape, but you know I, I spent a lot of my days training and working out harder and trying to be the best that I can, not just as an athlete but as a person too. And I was out and about all the time instead of trying to be cooped up and losing my mind inside like a lot of people were. <laughs> Um, but no, I, I went from two, 209, 215 down to the 185 range. Okay. And I, I just went through a total mental and physical reconstruction. And through that, like, I, I mean, I didn't see any of this coming. It's just something that I dedicated myself to. I put in the work, I put in the effort and I just said, you know, I, I prepared the best I could for this situation. Now I just have to, uh, keep up and keep up with maintenance on my body throughout the year to stay healthy and whatnot and everything just came how it was and through the mental side of it too a lot of it was manifestation and working through that too and visualizing yourself where you want to be that's really so let's, let's put a pen in the physical side of it because i do want to come back to that but the mental side right you don't hear a lot especially with this physical and as taxing of a position as a catcher is right you don't hear necessarily a lot of people talk about the mental. You hear pitchers, I feel like, talk about that a lot. So tell us more, like the the mental side of things. What got you interested in that? Was it books? Was it uh, was it people that you were working with? Yeah, um, no, it, it was books. And the funny thing is, is, I'm not a big reader, only because I failed third grade because of reading. <laughs> ironically, so I, I picked up a book. It was called uh, Relentless Optimism: The Power of Optimistic Thinking. And it honestly changed everything for me. It, it t tells a story about a minor league baseball player who was the man. He, he was the guy back in the day, gets drafted, he's in the minor leagues, he's not doing so hot, and his manager actually ends up helping him out, gives him a few books, reads it. Well, I ended up buying all the books that it mentioned in there. Yeah. Read all those books too, ironically. Um, but I was picking up things on his career and how he went about his business and got back to the major leagues and how he was with the Royals ends up winning game five with them in the World Series and he was a guy that delivered the game winning hit in 2015 and I'm like oh my gosh like this is awesome and this he's talking about visualizing hitting the ball over the batter's eye out there and he's doing this all on deck and I'm like I, I gotta try this so I start trying it once we get into fall ball. Doesn't happen, right? But the power of being optimistic was, okay, it didn't happen. Okay, I struck out. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, right? Three straight pitches. All right, walk back and I go, oh, you know, I saw the pitches really well. You're picking out the positives out of everything rather than just looking at the big overall negative. And next thing you know, you go up there, and I had literally thought this, and I go back out there. I'm like, you know what? I'm still the best player on this team. I'm still the best hitter, which – Numbers wise at the time, I was not, mm -hmm. but I was thinking that and I was really believing that. And I went out there first pitch straight over the batter's eye dead center. And I was like, all right, huh. this is kind of bizarre. <laughs> that works out okay. Yeah, yeah, right. Tried it again, stuck with it. And then all of a sudden come into mid season and it just clicked like no tomorrow. And spoiler alert. Um, this is not a true story. The book is not a true story. Um, I thought it was until I looked it all up and I could not find anything on this character. And I was so mad because it tricked me. And at that point in time, I was at 15 home runs in the year. And I was like, gosh, 
this actually it was all a sham. This is all but a farce. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay, this is a scam, but it works. Yeah. And it, the biggest placebo. thing that it talked about in the book was, you know, we train our bodies and we go to the gym all the time to be the best that we can physically, but we never train our minds as athletes. So when you walk into a gym and you turn around, you finally flip on the lights and you're in an old rusty gym, there's cobwebs everywhere. And you're like, oh, I don't want to work out here. Mm-hmm. But when you clean up that gym and you get the cobwebs out, you get the dust off, you can turn in, go in, flip on the lights. And you're like, yeah, I want to be here. This is a great place. And that's, that's what it really talked about. Did that rub off on any of your teammates at the time where you're like, were they like, okay, I can see this. I want to kind of get into this tour. They're like, all right, Matt's a little crazy. We're just going to kind of let him be on, on the, no, the, the visualizing everything. Like, did they buy in? Yeah, no, for sure. A couple of guys bought in and they all thought it was a physical thing. They're all like, dude, what are you doing? What, what are you eating? What are you taking? And I was like, I'm just eating clean yeah. occasionally. Um, but all for the most part, it was it was all mental. It was you know going out there, not letting my at bats affect my defense, not letting my defense affect my at bats, and it was just going out there and just really believing and telling myself, I'm gonna hit this ball 400 feet. I'm the best hitter on this field. I'm the best hitter in the country. And at the time, I was hitting 230, 250, and then all of a sudden, it just took on a life of its own, and it really bought in. And it's just one of those things where you get in the box and you're like, there's no way this guy's gonna blow anything by me. So then the other side of that's the physical side too. So that's what, 20, 25, 30 pounds you said you dropped? Like that's a, yeah. that's a, a substantial amount. Like was there a, a catalyst moment for that too where you were like, all right, I'm going to go do this? Or was it just something gradually with all the mental side and too where you're like, I just want to get better, well-rounded? It was gradually. Like I didn't plan on losing weight. I didn't walk in there and say, oh, yeah, I want to lose weight. I walked in there and said, I want to be the strongest I can be. Yeah. And I went from, you know, 215 deadlifting, you know, 350, 400 pounds as a three rep max, because that's what we did in college, to being 185, going back to my first uh, first week. And once we got to our three rep maxes and worked up to those about the third, fourth week of the fall, I was deadlifting 510 pounds for three reps. And I had never even picked up 500 pounds before. And our strength coach literally looked at me and was like, dude, I've never seen you do that before. You might be the strongest I've ever seen you. I said, well, I'm glad you said that because I feel the best I've ever felt in my life. Got rid of some of the excess, uh, excess weight or, and, and everything else just worked, huh? Yeah, literally. That's crazy. Because, I mean, when you look at your stats, too, it's, it's nuts. I think I even wrote it down. It was like 2019, I think you were like 282, you know, hitter. I think it was like, mm-hmm. you know, and then you went to, uh, I think it was 2021 after COVID. It was like 330. 23 home runs, 66 RBIs. Like, that is, when you look at the stat lines, it's a heck of a change, too. It's right. Like, and it just all happens at once, too. How do you keep that going, like, after that year and you keep that ball rolling? It's just being the same person that you were when it worked. And minor league baseball is, a, like, a lot different than college baseball. Routines are different. Um, the guys are different. People you play with, they're from everywhere. You're not with that same team the entire year. Guys get moved up, guys get moved down, guys get released, and you could be one of those guys. So it's more so just trying to stay in and be the same guy that you can be every single day. So the you talked about the changes, obviously, going from college to you know to professional ball now, too. What are some of the other things that fans may or may not even realize like is a giant jump between going from high school to college to now being professional? Like there's all kinds of stuff from the six game homestands to travel to what's the hardest thing to adapt to? Uh, so far for me, it's definitely the spreads. Just, we get good food, don't get me wrong, but um, at times, sometimes like, it, the caterers might mess up or like to put it this way, like we were in Fort Wayne and we had, I think it was Bob Evans or IHOP catered for us one morning and we show up to the field. Our food's not there. We're like, well, where's the food? Well, the away club, he took the food and gave it to the home team. And we were like, uh, well, we got a game at one read. o'clock yeah. and it is 11. <laughs> so let's find a banana or something. So there, there's a definitely a lot of stuff. You gotta, you gotta move on the audible sometimes and it, the six game homestand, the bus rides, you don't fly everywhere. You, college is different. College, mm-hmm. you, you're put on a p- pedestal and they feed you with a golden spoon. Yeah. Minor league baseball, you got to find it. You got to get almost it. taking a step back in the, uh, in how you're treated. It is real life. It is. We don't care where you came from, who you are or whatever. We're not your mom and dad. We're going to do what we need to take care of you, mm-hmm. but you need to do it by yourself too. You need to come to us. Do you like that? that 
approach better like do you oh, like yeah. yeah the because it's it's like the strong survive right it's like if the guy beside you is not putting in the work the guy beside you is not going to be at that locker two weeks from now oh yeah, yeah. A, a thousand percent and that could be the same thing with you like back to the being the same guy every single day you know yeah. you come in here and you're this you know happy joy go get them type of guy and then all of a sudden you start performing bad and then you're just oh yeah i hate life i hate this game i hate my job mm -hmm. you know you're probably going to be that guy it's hey man um, we appreciate you being here, but we're going to send you down or, you know, you're not really good for the team right now. Your, your morale's not there. We're going to release you. you know, that could happen. Yeah. So tell us about that actual move from college into the pros and, and getting drafted, right? You were supplemental first round pick 35th overall. Mm -hmm. Did you have an inkling? Like, did you have a pretty good idea of where you were going in the draft? And like, what, what's draft day? Like when you know you're going, you're just not exactly sure where. So it, I, I love that you brought into that. It, it's kind of funny because, so back to the whole manifestation thing, I didn't know where I was going mm -hmm. until I got picked. So this whole manifestation thing and the working on the mental side, it was kind of screwing with me in, in my sleep because I would have these weird dreams. And these dreams were like, one of them was I got picked 17th overall by the angels. And I was like, huh. Oh, okay, like, that was just weird. And then the, I had another dream where I got picked 30, yeah, 30th overall by the Braves. I'm like, all right, that'd be cool, like two first round dreams. And then I have like a dream about like the Diamondbacks, not like the Diamondbacks specifically, but like an actual snake. And like my coach said <laughs> something. <laughs> And then, like, the next day, my, clarification. Yeah. Yeah. And then my dad, like, the next day sends me a picture of this six-foot diamondback rattlesnake he accidentally ran over. And I'm like, okay, that's weird, right? Now I'm just, like, thinking all this other stuff. Now are you stuff. starting to think you're psychic, maybe? Or? <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> and there's a lot more to the dreams that I'm not going to get into. But, um, you know, draft day comes around, and me and my family, we're, we're out to lunch and whatnot. They're like, mm -hmm. so where, where, where are you going to go? You heard anything like I haven't heard jack squat yeah no one's told me anything and my agent's just like hey get ready for tonight you know you know what you're expecting late first round early second round and day one was only the first round mm -hmm. so i'm like okay whatever the entire draft i'm sitting there and i'm not even okay okay i'm not jittery i'm like i i know i'm gonna get picked i just don't know when so mm -hmm. i'm just gonna let it come to me i was calling the entire night 17th pick comes and i'm like Oh, well, the Reds have the 17th pick. Angels had already picked. I was like, oh, Angels pass. Okay, oh, Reds have the 17th pick. Oh, oh, cool, Matt McClain. Yeah, I played against him in the Cape. Cool, all right, whatever. And then I think the Braves had already picked at that time too, and I was like, oh, so it's not the Braves or the Angels. Hmm, I wonder who it's going to be. I get a text, hang in there from my agent. I'm like, oh, hang in there. Oh, okay. I'm not nervous. That's supposed to mean, right? right. And I, <laughs> a little cryptic. I'm not nervous. And then it comes around some more, and we're getting close to pick 30, and he says, hang in there, I'm working on something. I'm like, all right. Pick 30 comes. Red's pick. Falling along here. Mm -hmm. Dreams, 17th pick, Angels. 30th pick, Braves. Braves, Angels already picked. 30th pick, I'm like, oh, okay. Reds go, they pick Jay Allen. I'm like, oh, okay, cool, went with a high school guy. And I had... No idea that I was going to go to the Reds, but I had suspicion that I could go to them because uh, of the relationships that my agency has with the Reds and just stuff like that. Yeah. And so I, I was like, oh, that'd be cool if I went to the Reds. And ironically, um, I knew Reese previously because our two girlfriends are roommates in college. Oh, okay. So it's kind of ironic at that same time, too. So I get a, I get a text message at pick 33, get ready. And I went from just calm, relaxed to, oh, yeah, I'm going to flip out right now. So, I, <laughs> so You knew it was coming. Well, I thought it was going to be the Rays because the Rays had pick 34. I'm like, perfect. I'm going 15 minutes down the road. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I grew up here. So I say, Rays, question mark. He says, no. I said, Red's at 35. He said, yes. Girlfriend sitting right next to me, I show her in my hand from like, I went still the entire night to like, I was like, oh, here we go, here we go. It's real now, right? Nobody else in the house knew. And I'm just sitting there and I'm like, oh, okay. Agent calls me, he's like, hey, you know, play this cool, don't let anybody else know. I'm like, oh, okay. And so, you know, 
my mom goes, who was that? And I said, oh, it was Hank. She goes, what do you say? I said, oh, you know, see, see how it plays out tomorrow. Good job tonight. You know, sorry, I didn't go your way. She's like, well, now we got a plan for tomorrow. I was like, yeah, I know. So I'm just sitting there and I'm dying laughing. They're all freaking out. And I got a video <laughs> of it too. I told my buddy, I was like, hey, record this. And he goes, wow, said, just record this. And so, uh, Rob Manfred comes on, I know it's about to happen, nobody else happens, and they're all talking about what they're going to do. All of a sudden, she just goes on there, or he goes on there, and he's like, all right, with the 35th selection, announces it, and everybody freaks out. And she's like, did you know? I was like, yeah, I knew. <laughs> she goes, when did you know? I said, about two minutes ago. So, yeah. Right about the point where I lied to you. Yeah, right, <laughs> literally. That's all right. I'm sure she appreciated it. Yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, tell us a little bit about your parents, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we were kind of joking about beforehand, you have a very interesting spelling to your name, right? Right. So tell us, uh, tell us about you know growing up. You grew up in southern or northern Florida, I guess, right? Yeah. And tell us a little bit about your family, how how you got into baseball, because that's a, a pretty interesting story as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. So my mom's from Connecticut. My dad is from, I think Jacksonville. I know he wasn't born there, but he lived there a lot of his life. Um, so. When I was born, my dad wanted to spell my name M H A M M H A M A T H E A U, and my mom said, "No, that's too many letters." And he's like, "Okay, how about M A or M A T H E U?" And she was like, "Yeah, I like that." And the origin behind it is not because they're French, German, any along anything <laughs> along those lines. It is strictly because they could tell me apart from everybody else that had come across as Matthew Nelson. Yeah. And to this day, every doctor I've ever been to, orthopedic, dentist, you name it, they have all said I have never seen that spelling ever. And so I, I've tried looking it up. I've can't find anybody with that spelling. But that was back in high school when I looked that up. That's years down the road. I haven't looked it up since because I just don't care anymore. Uh, well, but, I can tell you yeah. from uh, from doing a little bit of research for this interview, <laughs> it was real easy to pull you up, and it was yeah. only you, right? I wasn't fishing through every other Matt Nelson in the world, right. so that was great. <laughs> right. That's too funny. So then you you get into baseball. You want to talk about how you get into baseball, and then also I think your high school story is pretty cool too, so I want to get into that here in a minute. Which high school story? Well, so I, I think I read you guys won like 60-something consecutive oh, games in high school. Right, like that's right, not, right. A, not a small feat by any means. Right. Okay, so getting into baseball, I was glued to the screen when hockey would come on. And so my parents thought I was going to be a hockey player. Parents didn't want me playing football because of the concussions and the injuries that always happen. I was five years old at the time. They put me into hockey for skating lessons. I cry in the middle of the ring. They put me into karate. <laughs> I don't want to do jumping jacks. They put me in the club <laughs> soccer at the YMCA. I don't want to run. My mom's like, my dad's like, oh, let's try baseball. She goes, no, I don't want to play baseball. You get hit in the head as a pitcher, a whole nine yards. My dad's like, oh, let's just try it. So they put you in the thing with the most gear on potentially, right? Right. <laughs> and it's ironic because she didn't want me to be a catcher either. Yeah. And so my dad's like, oh, he'll play any other position. You know, there's seven other positions on the field. And they put me in a baseball. I get a bat. I sleep with it that first night. Fell in love with it, never played another sport ever since then, since I was five years old. So fast forward to high school, and we get into high school, we have a really good team, a powerhouse team, but we didn't know how good we could really be until we started playing. Junior year, we go 30-0, and we win the state championship. Senior year, we go 30-1, and lose the state championship to the other Calvary Christian down in Fort Myers. So we had went 60 and won our last two years. At 60, like before you lose that state championship and you're 60 and 0, like are you just smacking teams? Like at that point, like you're going into the game and you're like, yeah, we've got this by like five, six, seven runs or were there squeakers in there? No, there was a lot of squeakers. I mean, the district semifinal, our junior year against Tampa Catholic, it was a one nothing game. That's We won on a walk-off base hit. Semi, or then we played the final and I think we won the final by like two runs so there was there was a lot of beatings during the regular season but once we got into postseason there was no physical like oh we are just pummeling teams they're not gimmies yeah yeah and it, it's actually funny and if he watches this podcast he might kill me for it <laughs> um then we should definitely tell the story absolutely <laughs> yeah um drawing a blank on his name right now one of our bullpen guys Ben Wall Mm -hmm. We played Pensacola Catholic 
in the final our junior year and Donovan Benoit was on that team. He brought it up to me. He's like, yeah, Christian Cairo, who plays for the Lake County Captains, bunning when he's up 6 nothing just to get a hit in the state final. What kind of stuff is that? And I was like, how do you know that? It's like, dude, I was the guy who came in and closed out against you guys. I was like, oh, so he was supposed to start that game, and we had prepared for him, and then they threw some kid who threw like 86, and we put up 11 and 5. <laughs> so it, it was kind of funny. Yeah. So also in high school, I think I saw it. You guys had a assistant coach that I think most people, a name they would recognize in Roy Holiday, right? Mm -hmm. So how was that? How was having the knowledge of Roy around, especially, you know, as you're coming up in high school and you're developing and you're learning all this, like from a catcher, I think that has to be pretty cool too, because there's probably certain things you can take away. You know, you could take away from someone like Roy that you just can't get anywhere else. Yeah, I know Roy was different. I mean, he was a character too. For how much of a coach he was, he he was a father figure to a lot of those guys on the team. Like, he he would get on you if you needed to get on you, but at the same time, like he would pull you aside and give you some coaching tips, some life lessons, and stuff like that. But I mean, the, the stories that I have of Roy coaching are comical stories. I mean, I have a few like serious stories, but like the best ones are the comical stories. Like we have the kid comes up to bat, got long hair down to his shoulders hits a line drive to our left fielder. Left fielder bobbles it for a split second, ends up getting a double out of it. Next at bat, he comes up again. Roy just goes, hey, she can run a little bit. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my goodness. He did not just do this. Yeah. Then another one, third base coach is creeping down. He's trying to peek in and like look into, like, look into my signs because this was the regional semifinal against Trinity Prep. And he's looking at trying to get in there and try and get signs. And he goes, hey, hey. The guy turns around and he's like, me? He goes, yeah, get back in your box. Get back in your box. <laughs> he goes, Roy, I'm not doing anything. He goes, I see what you're trying to do. Get back in your box. He goes, yes, sir. And turns around and walks back to his box. I'm like, you have that kind of respect in yeah. a high school baseball game. That is unbelievable. But, yeah, no, he was, he was a comical person. Yeah. So... Tell us a little bit now, like fast forward, obviously, into your professional career or even, you know, when you were in college, obviously a, a very well-respected catcher. Tell us, I think a lot of people that are just casual observers of the sport maybe don't necessarily understand all that goes into the catching position, right? It's not just the guy catching the pitches back there, but you're calling games, you're making a lot of decisions out there. Like, tell us about what it's like out there for the average baseball fan to understand what the role of a catcher is when you're here playing single A ball. Uh, it's the same role playing in low A, double A, triple A, although I have not been to the other levels. You know, I, I assume it's the same role just talking to other guys and even the big leagues because, I mean, you still have to do scouting reports. You have to look over hitters. You have to talk with your pitchers. You have to see what's working that day. So the role doesn't really change. It's more so just the fact that, you know, you're staying on top of your work and you're doing what you need in order to win games because – Yes, you get paid to perform, but at the same time, you could be performing, but your team could not be winning. So you're getting paid to win. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why you're here. You're here to win ball games. You're here to win a championship. How uh, the Dragons pitching staff this year, you guys had a lot of success, obviously, already. Mm -hmm. How has that been calling games behind there? I mean, are folks pretty receptive? Are you finding that the guys out here tend to know what they want? Or are you guiding people through the game a little bit more? A little bit of both. Uh, you got to learn the pitching staff, of course, and you do that during spring training. Yeah. And unfortunately, sometimes you don't catch some of those guys that are on your staff with the team you break with during spring training. So, you know, it's more so learning the pitchers, knowing what they like, where they like you to set up, and adjusting to the hitters mid-pitches because sometimes the hitters will tip of what they're not looking for or what they're not expecting. So you got to adjust on the fly constantly. So there's a lot of observing going on out there. thousand percent. So you've been on some pretty high-performing teams almost at, at every level you've been at so far. How does this team compare to those other teams that you've been a part of? This team is right up there. I mean, I mean, minor league baseball is way different. Everybody's really good, don't get me wrong. Um, but this team is really good, fundamentally sound. And, you know, Joey said it to us best the other day. He's like, there's a lot of big leaguers on this team. You know, you guys have to really believe that. And that's that self-talk we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. like, I've seen guys go from high A to the big leagues before. It happens. He's like, but there's a lot of big leaguers on, that t on this team. You guys need to believe it, and you guys really need to play like it. And that's something that he preached to us, which I was like, 
wow, that's that's awesome for him to say that. And he's only been here for five hours. Mm -hmm. How was it? So folks that are listening to this right now, yesterday, Joey Votto, obviously rehab start here playing again today. How is that compared to a normal game? So like you guys are in a groove, you're in first place, you guys are playing really well. Does that, I don't know, I guess throw anything off at all or a little odd to have somebody come in that, you know, there's there's different maybe distractions or the day looks a little differently than a normal day? No, the day was the exact same that we would go about our business. There was no difference, no distractions. I mean, just because Joey Votto walks in doesn't mean we're going to be like, oh, we're changing everything. Mm -hmm. right. Just because he walks in doesn't mean we're going to be different people. He doesn't want that, and we don't want that. Like, we want him to be the same person that he is in the big league clubhouse that he would be with us. Right. So... Yeah, was it uh, so? You were you were kind of talking about he was giving you guys some some thoughts mm -hmm. and, and, and advice and pointers. Are you able to pick up things like that when you get somebody that has the major league clubhouse experience, or do you generally find that those kind of things can come from the coaches just as well? Oh, they come from the coaches too. I'm, you know, D Ward, our hitting coach, has nine years plus in the big leagues. Sam has Juan Samuel, our first base coach. He's got a couple years in the big leagues. Brian, our manager, has a couple years in the big leagues. So it's. Yeah. You know, we're, we're not playing with nothing here. Like, all yeah, of our so. guys have seen some stuff before, and they all played back in the day. So everything they say is very good and very well knowledgeable. How has this year gone from your standpoint, right? You break camp, you come here, um, and you guys um, – you know, pretty much immediately start having success. Mm -hmm. Have you run into roadblocks? Have you run into things where you're like, oh, that's something we need to work on? Or has it just sort of been one of those where you're on a heater and you're like, you're just kind of wondering like, how long can we keep this going? Yeah, no, there's always stuff you got to work on, not just individually, but as a team too. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely been a lot of things as a pitching staff and as a defense that we need to work on and are still working on. And there's also as hitters too. You know, being more disciplined at the plate, I think that's a big thing that we need to look at more. And, you know, not just myself, but others, too, mm -hmm. because we have a lot of guys in the lineup that can really thump the ball. But on numbers and on paper, it doesn't show like we know it can. So I, that's another aspect where it goes. And this year, I know we talked about a little bit before we started recording is like there's the added wrinkle of you have a pitch clock now. Right. So. Can you touch on, I guess, a little bit how that changes both from you behind the plate and at the plate, you know, while you're hitting and while you're catching? Yeah, I mean, it speeds up the game a little bit. Um, you definitely got to think quicker. You don't have really time to think as long just because you got, what, 15, 14 seconds in between each pitch and then 30 seconds in between each batter or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it, it definitely speeds the game up as a hitter and as a catcher. I do like it. I think it's nice. The games go by really fast rather than dragging them out. Um, the front office thanks you for that as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very so, much so. Th we're, big, we're big fans. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> so, I mean, that happens. But, like, as a player, at first it was like, oh, I got to move quickly. But then once you, like, kind of got used to it, only here and there does it really speed up on you that quick. Right. Just makes things a little bit more obvious when, when it's slowing down on you. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, it, like... I think the, the tough part probably to break with a lot of people is like baseball, like a lot of things is so ritualistic where mm -hmm. it's like you have the thing, you know, your step out routine and stuff like that. And breaking that stuff, I'm sure, is tough for people at times. A thousand percent. Yeah. Because there's times where I have to get in the box and it's like I, I like to sit there and like relax for a second. But there's times where I literally have to get in there, tap home plate and throw the bat on my shoulder because the pitcher already has what he wants to throw. And as soon as you set in and you look up, he's going to start moving. Yeah. Be like telling Steph or somebody like, hey, for your next foul shot, you can only, you know, you've bounced it three times for your entire career. Now you bounce it once and shoot. Yeah. And for that, I'm not saying it's going to mess up Steph Curry, but for a well, lot right. of people that could screw up. They'd be like, well, I've never done this before. Although it's really not that different. Right. But it's just like, in the, like as a fan, I think some people are like, oh, you know, why do they have to step out? Why does it take so much time? It's like, because it's, you know, it, it's harder than you think hitting a, a 96 mile an hour, you know, four seam or something. You've got to take why your time. Why do you have to drink coffee in the morning right. before you go to work? <laughs> Same thing. I don't judge you. You don't judge me. Let me Literally. do my thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, and plus on top of that, what you're referring to is, you know, that, that's your livelihood, right? right? That's your career. And if your career, like, hey, if I'm comfortable... I've got a 30% better chance of getting a base hit here. Mm -hmm. Those numbers over the course of a, you know, mm -hmm. 150, 160 game season make right. a big difference. That can make a career. So numbers in general, that's another thing I think that baseball's changed over the past, you know, five, 10 years too. It's like the stat heavy everything. Um, we've got spin rates on everything that you could ever imagine. Like, does that change your approach at all over your career? Um, 
Yes and no. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of different how I think when it goes into hitting versus how a lot of people go up there and take their at-bats. So, I mean, like, yeah, it, it works for some guys, and, like, sometimes I like it, but a lot of times, like, I don't. So I kind of just adjust on the fly, just like how we've always been doing. Yeah, and there's two thoughts, right? There's, like, the crunch every number you can and try and get every advantage, and there's the, like, you know, take your mind off of a little bit, be natural, go up there and, and hit like you've always hit. Right, because, I mean, the numbers that we look at when we get our pitching reports are – you know, those are their numbers overall. Those aren't their numbers towards you. Right. Now, if they were their numbers towards me, I 100% would look at them and be like, okay, but, like, if if the guy's not really showing that many tendencies, then I'm not going to really, like, be like, okay, well, this is overall, but I'm a different hitter than Barry Bond. Right. You know. I guess as you, you go throughout your career, too, and you do have a bigger sample size on certain pitchers, that will be kind of interesting to take a look at, too. But you're right. You're facing so many people for the first time over the next couple right. of years that it's just it's almost impossible to crunch those. Right. Yeah. So as we kind of get to the end of the conversation here, I want to switch gears a little bit if we could. Let's talk about what you do when you're not at the ballpark. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of your waking hours are spent playing baseball and have been for many years now. Yeah. But what's life like for you when you're not here, whether it be an off day, whether it be before you come to the ballpark, or, or, or what's life like during an off season for you? During the off season, I mean, it's – kind of the same thing like except for you know there's not baseball every day Mm -hmm. you know I'll usually take a couple weeks off of baseball and kind of just like let my body rest recover for a little bit go have a little bit of fun go spend time with family and stuff like that just so that way I can you know get out of the way Mm -hmm. not so much get out of the way but (laughs) more so just make up for what I had missed which is a lie right a thousand percent and you know once that goes by then it's really time to zone in. It's like, all right, here we go. You know, I, I took a week off. I got to get back into it. And then it's just right back into training. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, once the season starts coming closer, maybe halfway through the off season, once you get closer to spring training rolling around is when you start picking up the baseball stuff again and start really trying to find that and working on all that other stuff. And mm-hmm. it's not just 30 minutes a day. It's, you know, you get in there first couple of times, like, oh, let me get comfortable. It's like, okay, well, now I know what feels comfortable and what I don't feel comfortable with. So I really got to get in there. What's, uh, what's your escape from the game, right? We hear a lot of guys that will tell us in these kind of interviews, they're like, oh, like when I'm away from here, like I have to disconnect because you're just on so much. Yeah, and, and that's literally what I have to do. I mean, I'll, I'll go home and I'll talk about baseball. But it's, you know, I'm not going to allow what had happened during the game to affect me, who I am as a player mm-hmm. or as, as a person. Because once you start bringing that out with you, too, is when you start getting all sorts of funks and things just start going downhill. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of escape is talking to friends, family, um, hanging out, going out and about. Um, I really like going outside. I don't like being cooped up in the same place. Uh, sometimes I'll just go out, go for a walk, or I'll just go drive around, go to a mall, walk around or something like that, go look at some stuff. Whether I'm buying something or not, I just cannot be cooped <laughs> up in a house. Don't I make me sit in my apartment. Lose it. Yeah. I would lose it. Have you gotten to get out, uh, out and around the Dayton area much since you've been here? A little bit. Um, not very much. Off days kind of just consist of, right now I'm taking two online classes for school to finish my degree. Okay. So cool. off days so far have consisted of doing some homework, you know, doing some lecture work, doing laundry, going to get food and just very unglamorous kind of things, yeah. right? Right. <laughs> the things that get neglected for the other six days of the week. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, you got that, that's certainly something to be said, right? I mean, this is your first time, like you'd mentioned when you're in college, mm-hmm. you're babied probably isn't the word pampered maybe is a little bit better <laughs> word yeah. for it. Right. But when you get on the pros, it's like you're an official adult now, right? Just like when everybody else graduates college, they got to learn how to do the laundry and all that stuff. Some of us have to do it in college. Right. But you know, is that much of an adjustment for you or are you pretty, pretty good with those kind of things? No, I'm pretty good with those kind of things just cause I was, I'm a very organized person. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't stand messy things like my closet's color coordinated. I'm that, oh, wow. I'm that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I am really that guy. Um, so no, in, in college, I was always on top of the laundry game, keeping things yeah. up to date, keeping things clean and neat because, you know, one of the things that I've like looked at was David Goggins. No, it wasn't David Goggins. I'm sorry. Don't quote me on that. It was another guy that I had seen. He said like the first thing that, you know, 
you should do in the morning is make your bed. Yeah. Because even if you have a really crappy day, you come home to a freshly made bed. You've accomplished something. You've too. accomplished something useful mm-hmm. for the day. And so that that's one thing that I like is, uh, you know, just kind of staying on top of your game. And, you know, even if everything goes down the hill for you, you can come home, look at everything, go, I did something useful for today, yeah. which is another positive. You're already a better functioning adult than most of us. <laughs> <laughs> so we know whose bed isn't made out of the three of us uh, right yeah. now. Guilty. <laughs> Got it. Well, hey, Matt, thanks so much for joining us today. It's been great having you in Dayton. We wish you nothing but the best of luck for the rest of this year. Keep it up down there, and uh, good luck with the rest of the season. Well, do. I appreciate it. Thank you.